<laughs> okay, next up, um, I'm going to is Leslie Tenorio and Wade Lucas of um, Big Idea Theater fame. It, it's been lovely to see so many faces in the crowd that are that are part of the Big Idea cast because Big Idea is my favorite theater group in Sacramento. And if you don't know about them, you should. You should go to, is it bigideatheater.com? <laughs> I think so. But it's R-E, not E-R. Um, yeah, but, but they're really doing some of the best theater in, um, in town. Um, so, and sometimes I think they outshine some of the more well-known um, theater companies by a lot, so go. And I come by my theater snobbishness <laughs> by uh, New York City, so... <laughs> please, please understand, when I say they are good, they are good. <laughs> so first up, we're going to have Leslie come up and introduce his story, Help, and talk a little bit about his collection, Monstrous, which has been eagerly awaited by many writers who've Who've, who've seen his work in Best American and O'Henry and Pushcart. Um, so I'm going to let him come up to the stage and then we're going to have Wade read his story for you. Help. It's about the Beatles. Well, thanks so much, Valerie, for inviting me to, uh, to be part of this. This is a really, really cool event. I was telling her when I walked in here, I was so surprised to see all these people. Um, there are a lot of literary events uh, in San Francisco, and you never see this many people. <laughs> Unless it's like, you know, Michael Chabon at the Herbs Theater, so... This is, yeah, this is, you know, and you have better chocolate, so... It's amazing. I see that on Facebook. So really, it's, it's, I, I really appreciate being in, invited to be part of this, and I thank Valerie for, for putting on such a great, um, program. Um, you know, I've, um, but the book came out, Monstrous is, is my first book, uh, my only book. Um, it's a collection of stor short stories that I started a long, long time ago, and I'm a very slow writer, so it took a long time to get the book together, and so I'm very happy to see it out in the world. It came out in February, and I've been doing a lot of readings for it. Um, I just, I just uh, gave a reading uh, about a week ago, and I think that was probably like reading number... 35 or 36, so at this point I'm really, really sick of hearing my voice. Um, so you have no idea how excited I am to hear one of my stories in someone else's voice. Um, it's, a, it's a big treat and, and a relief that I'm not the one having to read it. Um, so uh, all I'll say about the story is, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, the Beatles are in it and, and it's, it's based on a true story. And that's all I'll say and thank you again so much for coming. So you just want me to vamp while you're doing that? Please vamp. All right. This is me vamping. How you doing? Okay, we're ready to go. There you go. Just to preface this, this is new to me to do a reading like this, so I don't know how I'm comfortable yet. I'm, I'm going to start by sitting, but I'm so ADHD that I'll probably get up and maybe sit down again and drink a water. I don't know what I'm going to do, so... ADHD, this is going to bother me. <laughs> Sorry. That's not ADHD, it's like OCD, isn't it? <laughs> In our battle against the Beatles, it was my Uncle Willie who threw the first punch, and for that he said he should have been knighted. And I didn't argue. We fought them in 1966, the year they played Arenta Coliseum in Manila. They were scheduled to leave two days later and as, exec and, and as executive director of VIP travel for Manila International Airport, it was Uncle Willie's job to make sure that the Beatles' travel went smoothly, that no press or paparazzi detained them, but the morning after their concert, Imelda Marcos demanded one more show. 
a royal command performance for the First Lady. When reporters asked the Beatles for the reply, they said supposedly, if the First Lady wants to see us, why doesn't she come up to the room for a special exhibition? <laughs> they all walked away laughing, so the newspapers reported. He called me that night. It's an emergency, he said. Come quick. He hung up before I could speak, so I snuck two San Miguel beers from the refrigerator and headed out. I'm leaving, I told my father, who was on the sofa with his feet on the coffee table, staring at an episode of Bonanza dubbed in Tagalog. There was a bag of pork rinds on his lap and empty soda cans at his feet, and the whole room was littered with dirty plates and unwashed laundry. I even caught a glimpse of a bright pink bra that belonged to some woman he must have brought home earlier that week. We lived like this ever since my mom left for what she called her Vacation USA, which was going on its fourth year despite occasional postcards promising her return. Uncle Willie was one who watched over me, but I was 16 now, too old to be cared for. Still, if he needed me, I was there. I met up with my cousins John, John, and Googie. They'd been summoned too, and together we headed to Uncle Willie's apartment. When we arrived, we found him at the kitchen table, fists clenched like he was ready for a fight, and he only grew angrier as he recounted the story. Those beetles insulted the essence of Filipino womanhood, he said. <laughs> Special exhibition? Scoundrels! <laughs> I told him to calm down, that the, the beetles were just making a joke, but Uncle Willie said nothing was funny about Imelda Marcos. <laughs> He pointed to a framed black and white photograph of her on top of the TV, then brought it over and made us look. She is the face of our country. Can you see? In the picture, Imelda Marcos was seated in a high-backed wicker chair, frilled with ribbons and flowers, staring out into the distance, her queenly face shaded beneath a parasol held by an anonymous hand. The photo was a famous publicity shot. You'd see it in the mall or in schools or even in some churches. But I always imagined that it was Uncle Willie holding that parasol, protecting her from a, the scorching sun while he did his best to endure it. He wasn't alone in his admiration for Imelda. The country still loved her back then, but Uncle Willie didn't have much else. His last girlfriend before I was born his last girlfriend left before I was born, and the demands of his work, he said, allowed no time for another. Coordinating flights with Imelda Marcos' schedule was the closest thing he had to a romance, and instead of treating his devotion with admiration and respect, people laughed it off as a joke. I took the picture frame from his hands and set it face down on the table. Yeah, I, I can see, I said. Okay. He said, good, and the Beatles will pay for their insolence. <laughs> he dimmed the lights and drew the curtains and th as though someone might be watching from afar, then sat down to reveal his plan. The next day, just before the Beatles boarded their plane, Uncle Willie would divert the Beatles' security guards and then send the group to their gate, where he would be waiting disguised as airport personnel, ready to attack. I don't wish to maim them, seriously, he said, but we much, must teach them a lesson. He mapped out the scene with his finger, drawing invisible X's and arrows, showing who would stand where and who would do what when the time was ready to strike. But where he saw battle plans, I saw fingerprints streaked over a glass tabletop. And that, he said, is how we will defeat the Beatles. <laughs> I looked at my cousins, they looked at me, and we all looked at Uncle Willie. So what you're saying, Googie leaned forward like he was trying to make sure he heard correctly. We're gonna meet the Beatles? <laughs> <laughs> to defeat them, yes, Uncle Willie answered. But again, John John said, his face suddenly serious. Oh, we get to meet the Beatles? <laughs> Uncle Willie nodded slowly as if they were the ones who didn't understand what was really being said. My cousins looked at each other, then to me. I'm in, Googie said with a clap of his hands. I'll help you. Me too, John John said. Let's beat the Beatles. <laughs> Uncle Willie turned to me. Even in the weak light, I could see the strands of his thinning gray hair, hard and slick with pomade, and the deepening folds of his wrinkled skin 
around his eyes. He was in his late 50s then, but he looked older than he had ever before, as if I'd been away for years and suddenly back. You're my uncle, I said. Of course I'll help you. My cousins rolled their eyes like I was trying to be a kiss-up to the, be the better nephew than they were. Uncle Willie looked at each of us, took a deep, slow breath, and as if was making a history-making moment to remember forever. My men, he said, smiling proudly. <laughs> Uncle Willie cooked us a late dinner of Spam and egg fried rice, which we washed down with a case of San Miguel. He kept a supply on hand, should we ever drop by. Then he went into his bedroom and he came out with a stack of pillows and sheets. We'd need a good night rest, he said, if we were going to defeat the Beatles the next day. <laughs> but only Uncle Willie went to bed. My cousins and I stayed up gambling away what little pocket money we had in our own version of poker. I'm going to ask Paul for an autograph, Googie said, shuffling the deck, and I wanted to say to Guggenheim, citizen of the world, with deepest aberration, Paul McCartney. <laughs> My cousin changed his name from Mervyn to Guggenheim when he turned 13, believing that if you were named after someone great, you might become someone great too. But our grandparents couldn't pronounce it, so we got stuck with Googie instead, and he only used Guggenheim for special occasions like graduation or confirmation, any moment he believed would change his life. So you're going to punch Paul McCartney, then ask him for an autograph, I said. <laughs> Googie gave me a look like I was the slow one. We want to meet them, not beat them, he whispered. This is the Beatles we're talking about, John John said. Don't act like you're on Uncle Willie's side. Googie nodded. Do you think John would sing It's Only Love to Me if I asked, he said. John John socked him in the arm. Don't be queer. You can't, ask, you can't ask for autographs. You can't ask for songs, I told them. This isn't why we're doing this. We have a job to do, right? For who, John John said? Amelda Marcos? <laughs> he lit the last cigarette from his pack and then took a long, deep drag like he was trying to breathe in and contain his anger. He was a copy editor at a school newspaper. The week before, he worked on an article about the workers who died from heat stroke while building a Mount Rushmore-sized monument of the president, which the first lady demanded be finished despite the record heat. He showed me another article about a peasant village that had been bulldozed in order to clear space for a nightclub that was never built. And when they protested, two villagers were shot. Signs of things to come, he said. He turned the framed picture of Imelda Marcos over, then mashed his cigarette against it, leaving glowing ashes on the glass. They looked like fireflies dancing around her, which made her look like some sort of fairy tale queen, friend to all creatures, great and small. I flicked them off with my finger. Filipino womanhood, my ass, he said, shuffling the cards. Just one song, that's all, Googie whispered to himself and still rubbing his arm where John John had hit him. A light was still on in Uncle Willie's room. Just deal, I said. In less than an hour, John John and Googie were giggling drunks and they had all my money. I was tired of letting them cheat, so I finished my beer and got up from the table, a little more than tipsy, and went to check on my uncle. He always called it the second floor, but his bedroom was just three steps up from the back of the kitchen. <laughs> Despite his good pay, he lived modestly. He never bought a house and he lived in a small one-bedroom apartment for as long as I'd been alive. I like my things to be close together, he once said. I stood at the bottom step watching him, though, through the hanging strands of beads in the doorway as he ironed his work clothes for the next day. Behind him, Imelda Marcos was everywhere. Pictures and articles tacked and taped on the wall. Headlines that read, Imelda takes Paris by storm, and Imelda loves America. America loves Imelda. It was like a page from a giant scrapbook full of airbrushed 8 by 10s and photos carefully torn from glossy magazines. But the wall was only half covered, as though the other half was a reserved plot for the rest of Imelda's life. I imagined the empty space covered over the articles about Uncle Willie's victory against the Beatles and an accompanying photo of him, arm in a sling and face bruised, black and blue, a soldier still smiling after the battle, despite the hurt. Still awake, I said, to let him know I was there. You should be in bed, and so should you. I'm old, 
I don't need sleep, but you're still growing. He warned me about staying up too late, that nighttime drinking and gambling weren't the traits of an admiral man. <laughs> my sister would not approve, he said, and I suddenly pictured my mother on, a, on her vacation USA, lying on chaise lounge with cucumbers over her eyes and a towel turbaned on her head. I wondered what she pictured when she thought of me back here if the image made her long for me, or simply relieved that she was gone. I'm not a kid, I said. I don't need her approval. Uncle Willie shook his head and sighed and told me to come in. I sat at the foot of his bed. Uncle Willie unplugged the iron, then slipped the shirt into an armor gray blazer hanging on the closet door. Instead of the black tie he normally wore for work, he pulled from the top drawer a handful of ties I never knew he owned. And one by one, he held them to the collar of his shirt, waiting for the right match. Tomorrow is a special day, he said. We must look our best. I'd never seen Uncle Willie fuss over his appearance like this, and, and he'd been a bachelor all his life. But as I watched him testing tie after tie, when I saw a newly opened bottle of cologne on top of his dresser, I wondered if he was trying to end that. I could smell Uncle Willie, the, the change in his scent. It was on his clothes, in his skin, and the air around us. I was only 16, but I thought that this might be love. That if something could change you so much, then maybe, in the end, it was worth fighting for, even if you weren't going to be loved back. He reached for another tie, but set it down, laughing at himself like he was being silly. <laughs> Simple is best, he decided. He looped the black tie around the collar. No, 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 this one works better. I got up and I took it away and replaced it with a turquoise tie pattern with silver paisleys. It goes with the gray. Uncle Willie took a, a step back. He sat on the edge of the bed and he went over, wiping away a bit of dust from his shoe. He stayed that way for a moment and sat up and looked straight at me. Do you think I'm crazy? He asked. It was the kind of question you ask only to see if the answer you get is the one that you're hoping for. But Uncle, Philly's, Uncle Willie's face was blank. I really don't think he knew what the answer was at all, and whatever I said, he would take as truth. I think you're dutiful, was what I finally told him, and he didn't know what that word meant. Uh, dutiful, I repeated, it's, it's like the knight who enters a battle without asking why. This was the best definition I could give, and the answer seemed to please him. I'm honored to enter the battle, he said. After all she has done for our after all she has done for our country. Because of Amelda Marcos, he said, we the world looked at us differently. She dazzles and inspires, he said. Who of us is able to do that? He said that no matter how famous Amelda Marcos became, no matter how many times she flew off into the world. She always returned, always grateful to touch native ground. She belongs to us. His voice was breaking, I could hear it. It was our duty as men to protect her good name. I looked past him at an autographed photo of Imelda beside his bed. For Wiley, she had misspelled. Love and beauty, Imelda. It's getting late, I said. I, I told him good night and, and left through the hanging beads. At the bottom step, I turned around and I saw him kiss his finger, then press it against her picture. Not on the lips and not on the cheek. That wouldn't be appropriate for someone in his station, but on a spot near her shoulder, just above her heart. That part of her was sore, Uncle Willie once read, from all the corsages that had been pinned there during her travels abroad. <laughs> You see what she does for us? <laughs> He'd said, it aches her to leave us, even for just a short while. Then from behind me, a clumsy two-part harmony started up. You're gonna lose that girl. You're gonna lose that girl. 
leave him alone, I then said, <laughs> pushing them back in the living room. He's fine. The next day, the parking lot of Manila International Airport looked like a politically a political protest. High above the crowds were banners and signs, and all you could hear was the, the noisy overlap of shouting voices. As our taxi pulled up the to the curb, I thought that maybe Uncle Willie was right, that maybe the Beatles really had said something so unforgi unforgivable to bring all these people together. But when I stepped out, I understood what they were saying. Beatles, we love you! Beatles, we love you! Come back! It was painted on block letters, on banners and posters, and weeping teenage girls screamed the same message. A line of arm-linked policemen could barely hold them back. John John and I walked towards the entrance, but Goo Googie turned to face the crowd. He threw his arms in the air and blew kisses like they were gathered there for him. <laughs> I'm bigger than the Beatles, he said. John John grabbed his arm and pulled him along. <laughs> Uncle Willie flashed his IDs to security. They're with me, he said to the guard, gesturing to the three of us. He'd given us security blazers and fake name tags before we left his apartment, and they'd seemed convincing enough when we put them on, but now, standing at the terminal, we look like kids playing dress-up. Still, the guards let us through. We, park, we walked past the duty-free gift shops, the airport bar, the departing gates, and at the end of the terminal, Uncle Willie reached for his keys and unlocked a door that read, Airport Security Only. And we stepped into a long, white, and windowless corridor. We walked single file, Uncle Willie, Googie, John John, and then me. All of us silent. I looked back at the white emptiness behind me, and I had this feeling that the farther that we went in, the more impossible it would be to get back. Almost there, Uncle Willie said. He unlocked another door, and we walked through and saw an escalator that led to gate 44. But before we went up, Uncle Willie gathered us together and told us this was a momentous occasion, the first step in becoming truly honorable men. Then he opened up his briefcase and he pulled out a copy of the quotable Imelda, famous quotes from Imelda Marcos. It had been required reading of my freshman year in high school, an assignment I'd skipped, but Uncle Willie's copy was full of dog-eared pages and the, and the cover was tattered at the edges like it was a beloved book he'd read over and over and over. Listen to this, he said, opening to a bookmarked page, and let her words inspire you. He cleared his throat and he began to read. <clears throat> the truth is that life is so beautiful, and life is so prosperous, and life is so full of potential, and life has so much good in it that I get bored and tired with ugliness, with negativism and evil and all of that. I start in the morning and I feel that we all have 1,000 energy. In my case, I see a, a beautiful flower, a beautiful person, a beautiful smile, and by that time, I'm just about ready to take off. I have 1 million energy, no longer 1,000. This is why we are beautiful people, a people with love. And so we must live our lives in the name of beauty and love. He closed the book. Think about it, he said. I looked at John John, and all I wanted for him was to laugh, to make a joke about the First Lady, anything to break the stone look on his face that's, that stays with me even now. This isn't about her, I whispered. Then who, he said. Before I could answer, he started up the escalator, Googie a step below him. Uncle Willie was about to step onto the escalator, but I grabbed his arm and held him back. What if we lose? I, said, I asked. He blinked twice like the question made no sense at all. So I repeated it and I followed it with more. What if the Beals defeated us and refused to apologize for what they had said to the First Lady? What if the police arrived and threw us in jail? He, he could end up fired and, and what good would he be to Melda Marcos then? With every question I knew I might be sacrificing my only chance to meet the Beals, which would be one of the great regrets of my life. But this was my last chance to save Uncle Willie, so I had to keep going. There's a chance that we could lose, I said. With you by my side, he said gently, removing my hand from his arm. 
impossible. He stepped onto the escalator and I watched him rise up away from me, then step off at the top. Finally, I followed. Gate 44 was a small square room furnished with a couch and two wing chairs, a Victorian style coffee table in the center. To the side was a fireplace that didn't look quite real and above it was a painting of a life-sized Imelda Marcos. Her, her head slightly tilted, her, her arms reaching out. Run, Googie whispered to me, before she destroys us with her one million energy. <laughs> I told him to shut up, but it really did look like those Imelda arms were out to either pull us in or cradle us or strangle us to death. Uncle Willie called us to attention and reviewed the plan once more, and as soon as the Beatles arrived, we would escort them to Gate 44 and have them proceed up the escalator. The three of us would begin the attack while Uncle Willie and his own security team detained the group's bodyguards. And then finally, I will join you up there to crush the Beatles, he said. My cousins nodded as if they were with him every step of the way, but I was fixed on the mess of Paisley's knotted at his throat. How wrong they looked in the daylight, and his cologne smelled sour and sharp like, like vinegar mixed with rubbing alcohol. But, but who are we, I asked. What are we supposed to be doing when they get here? Just act like you're supposed to be here, Uncle Willie said, pointing to my name tag, as if you belong. He then shook our hands, wished us luck, and left. Standing there alone with my cousins in my room, in a room meant for only the most important travelers in the world, I believed I was answering a call of duty. I, I kept my fist clenched and my head up, ready for the fight, but all we had on us was a pen and paper for autographs, a camera hidden in Googie's pants pocket, and Ticket to Ride boomed inside my head. <laughs> we waited and waited, and finally, we heard voices below. From above, we watched Uncle Willie direct the Beatles toward the escalator. As planned, there were no porters to assist them with their luggage, and I heard Paul complain about the weight of the bags. Porter shortage in the Philippines, he said. No porter, Ringo asked. I'll take whatever's on draft then. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Willie hurried them along, and as, as soon as each beetle was on his way, he looked at us and nodded. It's up to you now, was what I read in his face, so I shut my eyes, trying to remember the plans he drew on the tabletop that night, the X's and the arrows indicating who and where we were meant to be. But all I could picture was Uncle Willie's reflection in the glass, shadowy on one side, full of light on the other. There one moment, gone the next. Then the Beatles finally came. And before that day, I'd known them only as a single sound of blended voices among guitar riffs and drum beats. I would play their records and watch the needle curve along the grooves, then try to work my own voice into their harmonies. I always sang in secret, embarrassed by my voice. When no one was in the house, I would sit on the floor next to the stereo speakers, belting out their lyrics like they were the truths about myself. And now they were here, and they were real, entering my life one by one on the escalator steps as the escalator steps rose and vanished into the floor. Ringo, then Paul, then George, and finally, John, who's holding a Super 8 movie camera and filming every moment. Each beetle was dressed in bright, loose-fitting shirts that seemed to change color with the, with the slightest movement, and when they stepped closer, I saw that their skin was the same way. Their white English faces were unexpectedly tan, pink in the cheek and red at the ear from the Philippine sun. It was the sign of their travels, evidence of a bigger world, proof that you could move through it and keep it with you. I remember standing there by that fake fireplace, standing between my cousin in our borrowed blazers and fake name tags thinking, this is it, this is the real thing, this is what it means to be in the world. Ringo was the first to speak to us. There's no porter shortage at all, he said. No, but... Shorter porters they are, Paul said, tapping each of us on the head. <laughs> but you can take these onto the plane if you don't mind. He dropped his carry-on luggage to the floor. The other Beatles did the same. John John picked up two bags. I followed his lead. But Googie just stood there, sweaty and pale. He was almost reverent in the way he looked at Paul, and he kept swallowing like he wanted to speak. 
my name is, he finally said, but he was so nervous, he mispronounced it. Hugengeim, George said, one eyebrow raised. Type of cheese, isn't it? All the, all the same, nice ring to it. Thank you, Googie said, beaming. Anything to say to the camera, Paul asked. He looked back at John, whose face was hidden behind the lens, which was now pointed at us. Go on, lads, whatever you like. My cousins and I looked at each other as if someone was supposed to cue someone else, give them the right words to say, but none of us could speak. Come on, man, Paul said. Give us a shout, wave hello, anything at all. I could hear the camera rolling, the filmed moments passing by. I had no idea if these were the Beatles' home movies, something they'd watch again whenever they wanted to reminisce, or if it was for the whole world to see, a way of bringing them along as the Beatles traveled the globe. Our silence continued. So I thought of the things people said whenever they were caught on camera. Bystanders on the TV news or athletes in the first post-victory moments. Hi, Mom. <laughs> that was it, so I stepped forward and said it straight into the lens. I even waved as if she could truly see me. My cousins did the same, and the three of us laughed nervously at ourselves. The Beatles started laughing too, and now we all were laughing together, like we'd been chums for years. I said nothing else, never even told them my name, but it didn't matter. John John looked truly happy for the first time in months, and, and even now I'm sure there were joyful tears welling in Googie's eyes. I, I wanted to plant myself there, take root in that moment with the, with the Beatles and my cousins, and, and never leave it, not ever. Quick as it was, the picture of it clearer to me now, the Beatles in a line facing my cousins and me, a four-on-three standoff that should commence into battle. But what Uncle Willie finds when he reaches the top of the escalator is a friendly exchange between his enemies and his allies, a truce he never called. And when I turn to look at him, it, uh, I'm just stuck, like someone ankle-deep in hardening mud and and I can't run or hide or change my traitorous face. I, I betrayed my uncle and the woman he loved. So I acted. Now, I said, I stepped away from the group and then pushed a potted plant over, hoping it would crash upon the beetles like a fallen tree, pinning them to the ground. But it just landed softly on a wing chair and dirt spilled everywhere, soiling Paul and Ringo's shoes. I kept going throwing bags across the room and into the fake fireplace, and Uncle Willie nodded like everything was going according to plan after all, and he stepped forward too. I picked up another carry-on, hurling it into the down escalator. Take that, Beatles! was the intended message. But it fell like a tumbleweed, and the only reaction I remember was George saying, that's my bag, <laughs> and Paul saying, yeah, he wanted to check that. I ignored them both and took took the gift basket of mangoes at Ringo's feet and kicked it over, the fruit rolling onto the floor, and I picked them up and I, and I threw them hard against the ground like grenades, all the while Googie struggling to work the flash on his camera. <laughs> John John took a fast, nervous drag of a cigarette, looking confused in the corner of the room. Don't just stand there, I said, but as soon as I ran out of things to knock over and throw, all I could do was remove myself from the scene. But Uncle Willie wouldn't stop. And soon he had John by the collar. So, you're the rascals who are more popular than Jesus Christ, he said. John nodded, the camera still in his hand, and Uncle Willie tried shaking him into submission. He was near tears about Imelda, almost incoherent, and what I saw next was his hand curl into a fist, and John's camera dropped to the ground, the film popping out, my hello to the world overexposed, gone forever. <laughs> Suddenly, a dozen other bodies rushed up the escalator, and they looked like real airport security guards. Come on, everybody, Uncle Willie shouted. For Imelda! For Imelda! They shouted back, and the mob closed in. I didn't know if Uncle Willie had planned this from the start, if he recruited true Marcos loyalists, because he knew we were going to fail him in the end. I called his name fighting through the crowd to reach him, but when I touched his shoulder, he swiped my arm away and told me to leave him alone, to get out, to go. Then someone shoved me and I fell backwards to the ground. Next to my hand was a mango. So I picked it up and I threw it hard against the painting of Imelda Marcos, hitting her in the center of her chest 
an orange pulpy ooze bloomed like a flower, then dripped down like blood. I wanted to call out to Uncle Willie to show him what I had done, but my cousins grabbed me, pulling me towards the escalator. It's over, John John said, let's go. We ran down and all I saw when I looked back was my uncle vanish into the haze. His war cry in the name of love drowned out by Ameldomania. We ran through the corridor and headed for the entrance. What about Uncle Willie, I said, and my cousins said to forget him that there was nothing he could do. I kept running, sweating in the thick polyester blazer, the name tag flopping up and down against my chest. I, I finally stopped at the long line of police trying to contain the thousands of fans who cried out, Beatles don't leave us! Beatles don't go! In the end, airport police broke up the fight, which lasted only minutes after we fled the scene. No arrests were made and the Beatles made it to their plane, none of them seriously injured, but they never came our way again. Yes, Googie told reporters, I witnessed the whole thing. We ended up making the papers, the international news, and for the first time the world came to us, calling late at night, knocking on our doors early in the morning for interviews. Googie basked in his brief fame, and John John tried to use the spotlight to expose the corruption in the Marcos government, but reporters just stopped their tape recorders and, and put down their pens when he spoke. I stayed quiet, letting everyone else remember and tell the story however they wanted. But Uncle Willie made his role in the attack known. And what he got in the end was a reprimand from the president himself. And Imelda Marcos, essence of Filipino womanhood, face of our country, called the incident a breach of Filipino hospitality. And she offered more quotable wisdom to help the people understand what had happened in life, ugliness must sometimes occur, she said. But when such ugliness happens, only beauty can arrive to save the day, so to speak. Despite the ugly events of the past days, beauty has returned, so let's focus only on the beautiful things and let beauty live on. Ashamed for any embarrassment he brought to the First Lady, Uncle Willie issued an official apology and resigned soon after but he didn't disappear. I still have one million energy, he said. He took a job at an airport shuttle, as an airport shuttle driver, carting chores to nearby hotels, and on his lunch break, he'd, he'd hang around the terminal, making sure Melda Marcos's flights were on schedule and offering unwanted advice on how best to handle her travels. <laughs> they say I'm a pest, but I know they still need me, he said. Melda still needs me. Years later, after I joined my mother in California, I made a final trip to the Philippines. Googie had run off to Hong Kong with an English businessman years before, and John John was dead. One of the few to take a Marcos billet, bullet in the People Power Revolution of 1986. But when I walked into Uncle Willie's apartment, everything felt the same. The ceiling fan still creaked when it turned. Beads hung in the doorway and there was a case of San Miguel in the refrigerator. The only difference was that Amelda Marcos's presence had grown. There were more stories and pictures crowding this bedroom wall, some of them recent as if she was still the first lady. We did very little that week. Uncle Willie was 80 years old and all he wanted to do was nap or watch television. But late one night, he told me he had something to show me. And he put a video cassette into the VCR. Watch, he said, then press play. The screen went blue and Sony the Beatles appeared on the screen doing an interview in which they mentioned the incident. Do you remember the battle? Uncle Willie asked from his wheelchair. How bravely we fought. I smiled and told them that I could never forget. I turned up the volume. I hated the Philippines, Ringo said bluntly. George and John agreed, smoking before the cameras, but Paul, Paul was more introspective. He had, it was one of those places where you knew they were waiting for a fight, he said. Uncle Willie nodded, confirming its truth. I stared at the Beatles' faces and I wondered if they remembered my, if they would know who I was if they were to see me now. If I had become an American like you, Uncle Willie said, I would have been knighted. 
I didn't tell them that they only do that in England. In America, you might get a compliment in the papers, or maybe a medal for bravery, but nothing that big. You would be the same person as when you started, long before the fight. That much I've come to know. Still, I told him yes. That most certainly he would have been knighted, and I proceeded to create for him a picture of the ceremony of Uncle Willie on his knee and Imelda on her throne a sword in her hand, its blade gentle on his shoulder. 